Hill a teaching uh, program called Steam Labs, which um, exposes them to the engineering design process in the context of designing and building Rube Goldberg machines. Do you work with Navajo Technical College? Uh, no, I've been working with ODSMT. Mm, entering. Okay, excellent. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Corona Gravitas. I am your assistant professor with the Morrison School in Food Industry Management, and I do consumer behavior research. Mm. Nice to meet you. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Lucy. I'm also a student at the Gar Morrison School. I do mostly energy economics. Heather Bateman, assistant professor. I'm more or less a wildlife biologist, and I'm interested in restoration of riparian habitats. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I know you. Feld, uh, I work on algae, so yeah. biofuels, bioproducts, and so bioremediation. My name is Althea Walker. I'm a senior here uh, on the Polytechnic campus. I'm majoring in environmental technology and engineering systems. Larry Olson, associate professor in engineering. Tim Richards, Morrison Chair, uh, Crime Nutrition, General Review Strategic Marketing. Thank you. I'm Kathleen Miller with the Office of Public Affairs here at Poly. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, Professor Eric Thor with the Morrison School, as Ari said, and I work with the NAPI and the other groups uh, in terms of their uh, grant uh, making process uh, uh, with the May College and the new uh, uh, redirection of Native American policy. Great. Um, Al, do you want to introduce you? Sure. And may I go ahead and just introduce you right after? Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Al Brown, and I work with Dr. Mariella many years. I'll actually go ahead and introduce her now. She is the director of the ASU American Indian Policy Institute over the Texas campus. Also, she's the former GEQ director for the Gila River Indian Community, just out of here, where she director of GEQ duties for 11 years, and we've had an opportunity to work on projects together that crossed boundaries when I was that director of the Maricopa County Environmental Services Department. We had plenty of opportunities to collaborate. Uh, before that, uh, Dr. Mariella was the director of the ADEQ, that's Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, Arizona Comparative Environmental Risk Project. I served with her on that committee, and we found some really interesting information, especially that Air pollution is our number one environmental risk in the greater Phoenix metro area. And you know, that was probably a decade ago or more. But more. I believe it is still mm -hmm. the most significant environmental risk. Uh, she also was the director of water quality planning at DEQ at the same time. And before that, uh, Dr. Mariella worked uh, with the uh, Arizona Intertribal Council of Arizona, uh, which was uh, mostly on environmental management and natural resource issues. She uh, has been a great professional to work with for, I don't know, 30 years now? Please, please, Al. Yeah, <laughs> I was a child then. <laughs> I'm really pleased to announce that on April 2nd, uh, Dr. Mariella uh, will be accepting an award on behalf of the ASU American Media Policy Institute from the National Association of Environmental Professionals, their Environmental Excellence Award, a national award for the uh, Joint Toxic Air Assessment Project. Uh, so, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mary Yellen. Thank you very much for agreeing to be one of our esteemed speakers here today. I'm thrilled. Uh, I have a fondness for the Polytech campus because my youngest son went to school here, got his degree in graphic information technology, and so I was here a lot. And uh, I'm so glad to see this campus continuing to grow and grow and grow. And real quickly, if you want to, as you leave or now, there's some materials here. There's my card. Please be impressed with our trendy quick response code on the back. You can use it with your smartphone to go directly to our website. And uh, just some information about different projects. Uh, particularly, we have an award-winning set of courses called First Innovations. And uh, if you have any students or you know of any students who would be interested in our courses, we encourage people from all over ASU to take the courses. And then there is a packet on the American Indian Policy Institute and our different projects. And I am the director, but we have an executive director. Our executive director is Dr. Eddie F. Brown, who uh, is a professor in American Indian Studies and was a former assistant secretary for Indian Affairs. He was actually the director of the Department of Economic Security for the state of Arizona. And he was the head of Health and Human Services for the Tonawatam Nation. 
uh, and it brings a wealth of experience um, to the American Indian Policy Institute. So um, I'm going to talk about mostly environmental projects, um, but I have been talking a lot recently about tribes being the laboratories of innovation. Uh, you probably have all heard states called the laboratories of innovation. And I'm going to make the case that I think tribes have always been a laboratory of innovation and continue to be. This is a beautiful picture from the Gila River Indian community. Um, and uh, one of our jobs when I was at the Department of Environmental Quality was to keep these beautiful vistas as clear as they are. Let's go. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you may have to hit the page down button. Oh, oh, how about just clicking with the mouse? There you go. So are you impressed? Did you see that? This is Slide Rocket. Uh, it's a uh, presentation software that we use. Kind of trendy, but it's nice. Mm. So about the American Indian Policy Institute, I think somebody was talking about responding to tribal requests for information. We are what we call tribally driven. Dr. Brown and I have written a couple articles on tribally driven participatory research. So we respond to requests from tribes. We don't have our own interests or curiosities and pursue them. We are also transdisciplinary, which means that we try to transcend <coughs> specific disciplines. I mean, we all have our training, but um, tribes really need to have support from universities that is as broadly based as possible. And in the past, um, Dr. Brown is very eloquent about this, some of the challenges or shortcomings of university research with tribes has been kind of a narrow focus within individual disciplines. So we try as much as we can to be transdisciplinary. Go ahead. Okay. Try it again. Okay, click one more time. Again, okay. So this is just real quickly some of our major projects. So we work in areas of what I would call governance. One of our big set of programs is we offer a tribal financial manager certificate. And uh, we've had people come from all over the United States to take this program. Uh, we use nationally known and recognized native faculty to teach the course. And um, it's a partnership with the Native American Finance Officers Association. We're right now involved in a very substantial project to analyze the census in American community survey data. Um, we focus a lot on sustainability and environmental management. I'm gonna be talking about the Joint Air Toxics Assessment Project, which is the project we're getting the award for on April 2nd. And we also have our award-winning uh, first innovations courses, which I mentioned in um, the flyer, is for the course in the fall. Go ahead. So if there's one message that I want to say over and over and over again, like a litany, is that tribes are governments. So I, I came from an era where you talked about tribal government. Um, we also say tribal nations. Um, but tribes are governments. And so sometimes people think about American Indians as being an ethnic group or a racial group. But in the American Indian Policy Institute, we work with tribes as governments that have governmental status. And they're not part of the federal system in the sense that they're not sub local political subdivisions of the state. <clears throat> so go ahead. So talking about Arizona, I love this slide. I use it a lot. What about tribal resources in Arizona? Well, tribes have actually slightly over 20 jurisdiction over 28% over of the land base within Arizona. Those of you who've worked here for a long time, you know that a good chunk of Arizona is also federal land. So tribes have actually more land than there is private land within Arizona. Tribes have 30 rights to 30% of the surface water that are determined by courts right now or by settlement. And potential claims, many attorneys would argue, of up to 100% of the water. 30% of groundwater tribes have uh, rights to. Uh, how about mineral-based energy resources within the state of Arizona? Essentially all of the mineral-based energy resources within the state are on Indian land. One of them being Black Mesa, 
the largest single coal deposit in the United States. Um, there's also sand and gravel resources, uranium, um, but also significant renewable energy resources. So the Navajo Nation is um, looking at a wind energy uh, project called near Big Boquias. Uh, many tribes have solar, either just like ASU does, having solar panels on top of buildings or other kinds of facilities, but more and more tribes are looking at what I would call utility scale renewable energy projects as well, and we've been involved in some of that. Uh, substantial agriculture, probably more than 700,000 acres at this point on tribal land within the state of Arizona, about $5 million in annual sales in livestock, significant wildlife, cultural resources. I'm sure you've all heard this word. It's kind of a technical word in this sense and that it usually refers to um, cultural resources based on federal law, which is often archeological sites and things like that. And then also the largest contiguous stand of ponderosa pine in the world is on tribal at San Carlos and White Mountain. Oh. Go ahead. Okay, so I put quotes around new because tribes have always been laboratories of innovation. <coughs> um, but one of the, the reasons that I think tribes are doing so much innovative work is that there's less bureaucratic baggage meaning that there's less institutional, long-term bureaucratic structures, so tribes have more flexibility to try new things in many cases. There's less physical infrastructure, so that tribes can try new approaches to electricity and other kinds of basic infrastructure, including telephone service and things like that. Relatively young populations, mm -hmm. um, so quite a bit of innovation often comes from young people. But importantly, there's also a long-term perspective. And I mean, it's a little bit uh, tried to talk about the seven generations perspective, but it is very real that um, tribal communities aren't gonna pick up and leave. And so they have both practical and cultural interests in not degenerating their resources for future generations. And in fact, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, which is on the other side of Scottsdale, actually has a strategic plan that has as its time frame, guess, 100 years. How many governments do you know even attempt to think about their future in 100 years? Okay. And by the way, just before we go, that photo there is on the Gila River Indian community in the area very close to the city of Phoenix where there's quite a bit of development but um, the community uses, largely uses reclaimed water for golf courses and for water features there. And they have a tertiary treatment plant there. This is an important slide too. Another reason that tribes I think are very innovative is there's significant need in Indian country. American Indians living on reservations are the poorest people in the US and that's true in the 2010 census. It's been true, sadly, for quite a while, uh, and it's still true. And this is just a picture of uh, reservation land, and so you can see how significant Arizona is, Arizona and New Mexico. Go ahead. Then here are the tribal governments within Arizona, two sort of different pictures um, showing the different reservations, and here, is a map that shows tribal lands in relationship to various river systems. Go ahead. So just a few facts from the 2010 census. Okay. Arizona is the state with the third highest population of American Indians slash Alaska Natives, which in the census is AIAN. Um, Arizona ranks sixth for the percentage of American Indian Alaska Native in relation to the total state population. And Arizona has the most on-reservation American Indian population of any state. Okay, so of the 10 largest American Indian populations on reservation, Arizona has five. Navajo, largest tribe in the United States, White Mountain, Gila River, Gila River is the fourth most populous Indian tribe in the United States. San Carlos and Tonatum. Question. Question. Um, so Arizona is a third of whatever. 
California is number one. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of peop Indian people live in urban areas in California. You don't cross the border with the... Uh, the Don't them? Yeah. yeah. Not, for this, not for census data. Okay. okay. But obviously yeah, people... interesting... Uh, it is indeed. Our executive director is Thonatham, and he every year does the Madalena Walk and goes into Mexico, and he doesn't need a, a visa to do it either. So this is a quote we use regularly. If you don't understand tribal sovereignty, you won't understand American Indians. This is a slide that I borrowed from Dr. Brown, Eddie Brown, our executive director. So tribal sovereignty um, is really at the core of tribal government, that tribes have the ability to make decisions affecting their communities. And one of the decisions is who's a member, who's not a member, what they're gonna do with their resources, and um, it is an extremely part, uh, extremely important part of American Indian communities. Go ahead. Now, we all talk about sustainability a lot at ASU, so I thought I would talk about it a little bit here. And um, generally, you hear about the three pillars of sustainability or elements or whatever, economic development, social development, and environmental protection. But go ahead. Particularly in our first innovations course, we've really focused on this. But with tribes, there's always a fourth pillar, which is cultural sustainability. And it is often, I would think, argued to be the most important to some extent, which is the longevity of the community. Go ahead. And here's a quote from Professor Simon Ortiz. He's a Regents professor here at Arizona State University. He's from Acoma Pueblo. And he is so eloquent. He is a, um, a poet and a writer. He's published many, many books. Um, they're very powerful, all of his books. But he came to our First Innovations class, and we asked him if we could write down his definition of sustainability. And what he says is, we as people are fed, nourished, maintained, and provided for by our land and environment. For thousands of years, the people, our ancestors, existed and lived within the context of a land they were a necessary part of. In English, it is, we do not exist for no purpose. We are not alive for no reason, always. For the purpose and reason of helping the land and the people, we are existing living. And it's a very eloquent statement. Go ahead. So, there were words, but I love this picture. Tell me where you think the border is with the Gila River Indian community. Right at the border. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. Here's Sun Lakes. There's agricultural land along the border. And there's Gila River. Right. I've never seen such a stark physical demonstration of the difference between communities. Go, go ahead. So one of the projects that I think was extremely innovative I'm going to talk about is the Joint Air Toxics Assessment Project, JTAP. And it was a multi-jurisdictional collaboration. It was initiated by the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community because they were very concerned about what air pollution, particularly air toxics, were being emitted from the freeways on their land, the 101 and the 202. And they contacted the US EPA. They contacted Gila River. And Gila River was very interested, too. Why would Gila River be interested in what might be coming off of freeways? Yeah. Well, Interstate 10 bisects the Gila River Indian community. And there's a proposed South Mountain Freeway that would go right through Gila River. Okay. And ADEQ, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, was very interested as well. And Everybody realized that pollutants don't recognize political boundaries. And we needed to look at the air shed. And that's what we did. And so this very interesting project was initiated by tribal governments. And by the way, the data that was collected at Gila River is essentially some of the most unique and interesting background data of, actually we have a whole, there was a whole air quality monitoring station there that's got what's called criteria air pollutants like particulates and um, ozone, but also air toxics. 
And if South Mountain Freeway gets built either on Gila River or off Gila River, close to Gila River, it will be one of the most unique cases where you'll have a baseline of before a freeway and you can monitor after the freeway is put in to see what the difference is. It'd be really interesting. Um, and I'm not, I don't take any political position on any of this. Um, but so we looked, at, um, we looked at the types, distribution, and sources of air toxics. Sometimes you hear them called hazardous air pollutants. We looked at over 200 chemical compounds. We looked at the air shed scale, and it was local scale. So there's actually quite a bit of data on air toxics, but it's sort of at a regional or a broader scale, and it was extremely high quality data. Um, we had Everyone got together. This was one of the most exciting parts of it. We would have meetings. Everybody would get together, and, and we coordinated it. Initially, it was coordinated by the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals at NAU, and then it came to ASU, and we coordinated it. And all the jurisdictions would get together. And there was a little pilot study, and we sent in the canisters. You sent canisters to the lab to be evaluated. We realized that the detection limits at the lab were not low enough to actually be able to do any risk assessments. And so we decided to do less samples and pay the money to have the analyses done at a much more um, refined and sophisticated level so we could actually do risk assessments. So it was extremely high quality data. The quality assurance, quality control in this project was very high. And it was double checked by outside consultants as well from Sonoma Tech. Um, and then of course we wanted to determine the health risks from air toxics. And most of the health risk outcomes for air toxics are cancer risk or premature cases of cancer. There are some air toxics that will produce neurological damage or potentially even um, genetic damage, um, but mostly we're looking at cancer risk. And we wanted to reduce health, health risks from air toxics. Mm. Go ahead. This is a piece of equipment that is still at Salt River. It's called a DOAS. And it shoots a light beam across the freeway and gets real-time information. It's still there <laughs> about certain air pollutants. And um, you, you can see the freeway, I think, in the background. <clears throat> and this is one of the pieces of equipment that was used as part of the project. But we all know air pollution doesn't recognize political boundaries. And so both the state and the tribes knew that they needed to work together on this project to be able to actually understand what's happening with air toxics in the valley. And this just tells you a little bit about the specifics um, at the, the sites. And I'll show you a, a picture of where the monitoring sites were sampling. Uh, we sampled for one year at all seven sites and also gathered meteorological data because we needed to be able to model. And really the key tribal interests were are air toxics coming onto tribal lands from neighboring urban areas. So when we started the project, there was quite a bit of interest, um, particularly at Salt River, about whether there were stationary facilities, um, industry, uh, other emissions that might be transporting or, or moving through the air onto the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. And we wanted to know what was being emitted from the freeways on, on particularly Salt River's land. So, and this is, the uh, overpass at Salt River of 101-202. Go ahead, Al. All right, so we had a multi-jurisdictional steering committee. And there was consensus decision making. Um, and one of the things that really facilitated that is the great tribal policy that the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality has and has had since the 1990s. In fact, they were the first state agency to develop a tribal policy and the first statement is, the state will not assert jurisdiction in Indian country um, for environmental purposes or regulatory purposes. And by making that statement, it opens so many doors for collaborative work because the tribes are not worried that the, st the state might be offering help to be able to get their foot in the door um, jurisdictionally. And so there's quite good relationships between the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality and tribes. A lot of cooperative work to the benefit of everybody. Um, the American Indian Policy Institute, we provided coordination and technical support. My particular background, I do a lot of risk assessment. So I was one of the lead people for risk assessment, risk communication, and developing the risk strategies, risk reduction strategies. And importantly, for funding, and this is one of the really unique things about this project, 
is that the US EPA funded each jurisdiction separately with separate cooperative agreements. So everybody got their own money. It wasn't like it went to one entity and everybody had to like transfer the money or share it. And that was very important. Everybody got control of their own resources and dollars to do the project. But there was an overarching blueprint and everybody worked together. Go ahead. So the core monitoring agencies were the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian Community, Gila River, and Arizona DEQ. But we would have periodic forums and all the local jurisdictions came. Of course, oh, that should be capitalized, EPA Region 9 and OAQPS, Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards in um, North Carolina. They actually place based a person in our offices on the Tempe campus for almost a whole year who actually did the stationary source risk assessments. Um, Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation participated, Maricopa and Pinal Counties, and the Institute for Environmental Professionals at um, uh, NAU. And here's a picture of the <laughs> air quality monitoring team at the time at Gila River. Go ahead. And this is the monitoring station where the air toxics were gathered. It's a regular standard regulatory air quality monitoring station. You can see the Estrellas in the background. It's actually at Australia Mountain Middle School. And one of the reasons we put it there is not just because the infrastructure is there that we need, like electricity, but we wanted children, the, young, the students there, to participate. And they do. They come. They use the data from the station. And we're always looking to grow the next generation of environmental managers. So what did we look at? We looked at mobile source um, emissions from cars and trucks, um, a whole range of pollutants. We looked at stationary sources. And then um, we did some analysis of, of background, particularly Carbon tetrachloride, you find it everywhere in the United States. It's gradually uh, decomposing over time. There's not much anybody can do about it. It's not used very much anymore. Go ahead. Um, we did some speciation. This is always a word that like interests people. It means you just further analyze it, really, and, and look at the, the maybe Dr. Olson can, can say more about this. You look at the constituents of different parts of the uh, fine particulates. So particulates are interesting because we monitor, we meaning regulatory agencies, for particulates, but they can also be toxics. Um, so we were looking at that part of particulates. And um, so what were some of the initial, what were the results? Um, overwhelmingly, the greatest health risks, which were cancer risks, came from diesel particulates, 90%. Um, and dropped dramatically. Of course, benzene is background throughout the whole United States at greater than one in a million risk, which is one in a million risk for cancer, which is EPA's sort of regulatory guidance level. Um, but it is, it is coming down. Um, and we found it here. We found it in Queen Valley at levels higher than one in a million. Mm. Go ahead. Could I ask you a question about this slide, unless you're going to be getting into this more? Maybe. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, some of those are from combustion sources, hot up by tailpipe emissions, like mm -hmm. sulfur, butadiene, and benzene, for example. Are they arsenic and cadmium? Maybe not. Where are those coming from, you think? Those, we looked for them, and um, some of those are natural. And then some of them are part of the particulates that were coming on and off from the whole project. So you can find them um, anywhere almost, essentially. Yeah. Or maybe just constituents of soil. Exactly. It needs to be added to the fertilizers of cotton. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a big issue. It's a big issue in the West here, as, as uh, you know. And the uh, chloroform. That was a st stationary source. So was the styrofoam. <laughs> um, mm. Your station is pretty near that uh, Lone View Industrial Park? Nope, it's not. Um, and it wasn't just our stations that found this. This is for the whole project. Okay. So you're looking at places in Phoenix as well. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. Oh, this is a lot of, about the modeling. Um, 
Here's an interesting picture, though. We, we actually have pictures at, at Gila River because there's a lot of unpaved roads. And this is sort of stepping aside from air toxics and just looking at particulates. I have a picture of a little girl waiting for a bus, school bus. And then the bus comes and she's on an unpaved road. You have the picture before, you can see her very clearly. The bus comes and you cannot see the little girl. She's breathing in all those particulates. Um, and that's what happens with unpaved roads. But to be able to do the risk assessment, we had to do pretty detailed emissions inventories. And we did that. And then we put the data into a model to, because you have to look at actual exposures for um, air toxics. There's not an ambient standard for air toxics. And this was a tough part of the project. Go ahead. So this was the study area, so the, the air shed. So this general area, go ahead. And here's where the monitoring sites actually were. So you always want to put a monitoring site both where you can actually put it because of the physical infrastructure, but where it's also meaningful. So Salt Rivers put theirs by their senior center because seniors tend to be highly vulnerable populations at um, Gila Crossing or St. John's at Gila River, we put it at a school because young people are highly sensitive populations. And then ADEQ already had certain sites, but then they also got permission. This site was a real interesting one um, for the freeway emissions. Go ahead. Greenwood? Yep. Is that the one you mean? Mm-hmm. Go ahead, one more. Actually, press it again. OK. So we gathered our monitoring data. We crunched numbers like mad to do the risk assessment. But then you want to not just understand it. You want to reduce risk. But because the numbers were somewhat different and the exposures different in different populations, each jurisdiction sort of took it on their own at that point to talk about reducing risk. And I sort of joke about this, that this is an old slide from my risk, risk management days. This says risk perception, and it has people seeing a stone about ready to fall. And then risk assessment, they're talking to each other. And then risk management is they're running. Um, and we did all of this as part of the project. And one of the things that was done was to look at school buses. And you've probably heard of these programs. They call it anti-idling. But it's not like anti-idling. It's uh, reducing idling of school buses, particularly school buses that may be diesel. And keeping them away from keeping their emissions tailpipes away from the intake for the air systems of the schools. Um, fairly simple things. And then things individuals can do as well. Like when you're driving down a freeway, you put on the recirculate button. Okay, Go ahead. Okay, so this is just about a little bit about risk communication, which is one of my fields. Because we had cross-cultural risk communication in this project, or multicultural risk communication. This is a slide or a, a piece of information that was developed by Sonoma Tech, one of the consultants on this project, and is such a dense piece of information. It takes you like 20 minutes to look at. It's really interesting because you see a lot of information all at once, but it's not very good at communicating to the public. Okay. And I sort of joke, it says, the, the risk manager is saying, be careful. Is that all you can tell me? Be careful? No, you want to be more specific than that. And so we attempted to do that. And all of us on the JTAP project came together and developed a message, we called it, that everybody agreed to. Go ahead. And here I'm just going to show you, this came from, this is, these are the VOC density map. And one thing you want to notice is that within the valley, the transport area for ozone as well tends to move in this direction. So if you follow ozone, for instance, um, a pollutant under the Clean Air Act, it's one of the main constituents of smog. Um, and it has serious health, health effects. It can burn your eyes, burn your nose, burn your lungs. Um, it's formed by the action of precursor chemicals that are generated as emissions, 
a lot by vehicles, and by the action of heat and sunlight as it moves through the air. So the highest levels of ozone in the valley are not find, found where the biggest sources are. They're found in the transport areas, just like some of the, uh, yep, exactly. So the Fort McDowell, Yavapai Nation, and Mount Ord are where some of the highest um, readings for ozone. And also, you can see how our VOC map is distributed as well. Okay, go ahead. Okay, some trend perspectives. So what are the national trends? I think I talked about this. Ben benzene is found in all urban areas, but the trend is down. Diesel is starting to go down because of the diesel rule with um, improved diesel fuels and diesel engines that are being required. Go ahead. Okay, now, so JTAP is, I think, one case of a fascinating, innovative, multi-jurisdictional project. And now because there's so many people here interested in agriculture, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. When should I stop talking? Hey, about five, less, less than ten minutes. Okay. You all hanging in there? Questions? You're still awake? It's kind of warm in here. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, as you're talking about agriculture, you keep forgetting about the livestock. And I, I can tell you most of the disputes we handle with them Navajos and the Hopis in those rural areas, not in the urban areas, are livestock issues. Right. As you know, there's this huge sort of underground economy where the goats and the uh, horses and the cattle get sold back and forth. Yes. And I would say uh, it's probably a $50 million problem here in Arizona. Right. Um, very important part of the economy, no question about it. Um, and I'm I'm aware of some really interesting activities that are going on in that area. It's not an area I've worked in a lot myself, okay. but, but um, maybe you can share some. It a lot to the water, what we call uh, challenges, particularly up in the minor streams. Sure. Little Colorado, et cetera. Just like everywhere, including off reservation <laughs> lands. <laughs> well, yeah, but. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, absolutely the case. So, I always say that tribes were the first farmers in Arizona. Often I'll have a, a sentence after that says, and probably they'll be the last. And why would that be? Really yes. <laughs> okay. Tribes have rights to water. <clears throat> and um, so essentially all the tribes in Arizona grew crops. Some were more sedentary using very substantial irrigation systems. Others were more using rain and runoff, but agriculture was a part of the economy here. So what's the finest cotton for our underwear? Pima cotton. All right. Long strand cotton makes it smooth. All right. Where was that developed? Gila River Indian community. <laughs> it was genetically bred there. A nice irrigation system. All right, so tribal innovation. Tribes have always been doing innovation and um, applied research, I would call it. Domesticated what? Half of the crops that we use today. Certain types of cotton. There was Egyptian cotton too. How about this? Potatoes. And this is just one variety. There's like 30 varieties of potatoes that were grown in South America. Tomatoes, squash, chocolate. How can we live without chocolate? <laughs> um, corn and tobacco. We could go on and on and on. Okay. Um, so I think this innovation and I call it applied research has been a core element of American Indian communities for a very long time. And we talk about this in the first innovations classes. Go ahead. So, when I first got to Gila River in 1995, um, one of the big issues had to do with the aerial application of pesticides within the community, of agricultural pesticides. And so who's that guy? He's got a long nose. Bull yes, evil. he's a boll weevil. Oh. Okay. And um, of course, there's a lot of cotton grown at Gila River. And um, there's a classic, kind of low flying plane at that particular moment. But there was a, a certain amount of concern among the community 
um, about the aerial application of agricultural pesticides because homes are very close to the fields or in the fields in some cases. And um, we worked through, there was a great deal of interest and willingness for everybody to come together, all that you would call stakeholders, the growers or farmers, the applicators. And the growers at Gila River includes Gila River Farms, so that's a tribal enterprise, includes Gila River farmers and farmers who lease who are not from the community. So you have a highly diverse growing farmer community there. And then um, there's the health people and the elderly and um, people who lease their land and get money from leasing their land for their farms. We brought everybody together and worked for about a month and a half to come up with a approach that people could live with. Mm. Consensus, does it mean it's everybody's feeling great and they got everything they wanted? Consensus is everybody can live with it. It'd be ideal if you could say everybody will support it. That may not always be the case, but everybody can live with it. And so the pesticide initiative came up with some great results. Go ahead. Okay, and we were always focused on results in the environment. So there were staff people in the Department of Environmental Quality who would talk about, oh, we did this number of inspections. I'd say, well, what was the result? Nobody cares how many inspections you did. They want to know what happened. Okay. And the results in the environment from the pesticide initiative was, oh, the number somehow came off. Um, there was a 40% reduction in the volume or amount of aerial agricultural pesticides applied in the period between 1995 and 2002. Mm. And the toxicity of the pesticides also was significantly reduced. And usually those are variables that go in the other direction, the opposite direction from each other. The less toxic the pesticide, the more you apply. But both were reduced. And this is an interesting use of both highly quantitative data and more qualitative data, sort of like Consumer Reports does with their lists, if you've ever seen that. Because toxicity of pesticides is determined by what are called signal words. And there's a, a set of criteria and they're ranked by how toxic they are. And we, it's actually required in the Gila River Pesticide Ordinance that every aerial application has to be reported and the data is collected at the Department of Environmental Quality. So we had 100% data for every aerial application of pesticides. Okay. This was really significant. That is a result in the environment. Okay. Then, we also did cleanups. <clears throat> um, there were three million shredded tires at Gila River uh, near Coolidge. It's kind of a long story. I won't go into it, but the short part of it is, is that every time you buy a new tire, you pay a little fee. Um, and when you take, when you have a used tire, an old tire, it's by law in the state of Arizona supposed to be recycled. Well, when that program was first started, the company that got the contract had a pilot plant to um, essentially burn the tires into their constituent materials and sell it, but they'd never actually done it at a commercial scale. And the counties contracted with them and they kept shredding tires and they would get paid. They'd get paid that money that you paid. And they, but they, they didn't have their financing for their big plant and they had to store the tires. So they approached one of the industrial parks at the time that's in this uh, very, very eastern part of the Gila River Indian community near Coolidge and asked if they could get a temporary permit to store their, their tires there. Well, the community ended up with three million shredded tires on their land and the company went bankrupt <coughs> and were judgment proof. Pretty common actually. And um, so, there were a lot of efforts to get that resolved, and then what happened? They caught on fire. It was one of the largest tire fires in the United States. It was nasty. Al was working at Maricopa County at the time. A lot of jurisdictions came together. And, but the good news is, there was a settlement reached. Uh, 
EPA used a very interesting provision of the Resource Conservation Recovery Act that they don't use very much, um, where they issued stipulated penalties day by day, rather than cleaning it up and then going after the recovery money. And boy, that brought people to the table fast. I remember one of the attorneys for the county um, joked at a meeting, he said, boy, I sure hate getting into lawsuits with attorneys whose bosses print money. And what they meant were the federal EPA attorneys <laughs> who were on the other side. And you know, they, are, they do this for salary, but companies will pay on an hourly basis for their attorneys. And those stipulated penalties, which were pretty high, they were like $10,000 a day, got everybody to the table, a settlement was reached, and the tires were removed. They were put in a monofill. These tires that had burned, some of them hadn't burned, some had burned. And that site is completely cleaned up to the level of where it can be used for commercial purposes. So it's a brownfields that can be used. You can't live there. We couldn't clean it up to that level. But you can have a commercial, and it was in an industrial park. Toxaphene, one of the old pesticides. Doesn't break down very easily, and, but it can be remediated. But out in the um, natural environment, it doesn't break down very quickly. And there were a lot of toxaphene contaminated sites at Gila River from pesticide airstrips, abandoned pesticide airstrips, where it would drip or be spilled. And we were able to clean those up, again, to commercial use levels um, quite readily by digging these pits. You line it with um, sheets of plastic, and you put water in and um, natural bacteria. And within six months, you can get amazing cleanup levels. And there's perchlorate at Gila River, too. How many people have dealt with perchlorate? It's a jet engine contaminant. There was a jet engine fuel testing facility at Gila River, and there's per perchlorate contamination there. Go ahead. Um, so that, I'll probably just stop there and take questions. What do you think? Or Because I'm, I was going to talk a little bit. One really interesting project, well, I'll just finish with this, is that the DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality at Gila River, has joined together with the Cultural Resources Program there. And they're doing a study on prehistoric and historic dust and comparing it because everybody says oh we live in a desert there's no way you can stop dust but then there's a lot of evidence like at Oregon Pipe National Monument where there's a monitoring station that if the desert isn't disturbed it has a nice patina on it and you don't get a lot of dust so what's one of the ways that you could check that you look at dust and sources of dust in the past. This is going to be a really interesting project, and it's getting some good funding, too. So just ongoing, unique, um, and interesting activities that are happening in Indian country surrounding all of us. And any questions or ideas or comments you have, I'd love to hear them. I don't really know, <laughs> because I'm, I'm not at Gila River anymore, but I heard a presentation on about a year and a half ago, and I said, oh my gosh, this is really fascinating. I really want to follow this. It's so interesting to see if they have things like, you can find anything like benzene or arsenic, you know, and dust from uh, 500 years ago. I don't think they'll find benzene, but no. they might find arsenic. Mm. There's quite a bit of natural arsenic at Gila River. They have it in um, groundwater. One of the things that's really complicated the decision making within the tribes is the clans. I mean, you know, particularly in the Navajo clans, they determine ownership of the property. And so they're trying to figure that all out. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're trying to work with them uh, at their request, come up with ways they may be able to do that when they're setting up like this uh, value added corn cooperative. And, and then the other thing, uh, which is sort of an interesting one that a few of the uh, tribal members have taken on is linking the uh, Native American medicinal herbs to the Chinese and Asian medicinal herbs. 
there's a, poten a huge potential for that. Absolutely. And uh, you know, some of those things that add value and income, and while obviously it is very important for all of us to do, deal with the earth we live on, one of the biggest challenges up there, and you've been up there many times, is just our basic housing, basic mm -hmm. lifestyle. The fact that, frankly, we're still dealing with cars that are 25 years old, not, Fun. you know, of the latest EPA standards. So Fun. I think one of the things we could do is at least share some of our graduates. We've got two of them right now that are working with, uh, you know, the Conservation Corps and stuff on some of these bigger issues, including the livestock issues. Uh -huh. in the rural areas. It, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to make a plug for our first innovations classes where students go into teams and come up with innovative ideas for um, ventures. They can be nonprofit, for profit. And the student teams have come up with fascinating ideas. Um, essentially, all the students are American Indian. Some of them look at um, uh, medicine and um, different kinds of um, cosmetics. I mean, it's been such a wide range of interesting projects. And so I think there is there is a lot of potential there. And we're hoping some of the students might get one of the Innovation Challenge grants to move forward with their um, prototypes and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree. There was one other thing you said about the, uh, the cars and how old they are. You know, that picture of the little girl where she's waiting for the bus and then the bus comes on the unpaved road. Well, then she gets on an old school bus that's belching diesel out the back. There's no air conditioning, so the windows are open, and she's breathing in all of this every day. It is a serious yeah, it is, it health is risk. This is a real problem. In fact, one of our uh, native uh, Navajo persons was a driver. Yeah. And he's driving on those roads, and he's having to use the older trucks because they don't have any mm -hmm. current ones. And he admits it's a disaster. But by the same token, who's going to pay for it? Run. Well, that's p part of the risk reduction is that the community is looking, um, as always. Uh, but now they have some real concrete tools and data to show that there's a need for um, newer school buses. Mm. Mm. Can you give us an example of the types of projects that students are considering in their class? Oh, there's so many. They run such a range. We've had an, a lot of classes, so gosh, we must have had they run the whole range. Um, one set of students wanted to start a, um, a, you know, these cruise lines, and they'll go up to Alaska and all this, and they stop at Sitka and places like this. But there's no involvement from the tribe, so they wanted to have a tribal cruise that would then provide more of an authentic experience. Um, and um, you know, I think they could get funding for that one. But um, so that sort of was a for-profit. Then there was a young woman. Um, she was Navajo, and she wanted to start a nonprofit that would support families in doing the coming of age ceremony for girls because it's complicated, it can be expensive, it requires land, and particularly for young girls that are here in urban areas, it's harder for them to be able to do that. But that's how you become a member and become an adult. And I, we helped her. We really wanted her to be able to get that innovation challenge dollars, but she did not because um, she was looking at a nonprofit, and they don't usually look at that for the innovation challenge here at ASU. But we, well, one of the things we're doing is the students are going to start doing posters. They usually do a final presentation in front of a panel of people who actually fund projects. And um, they do PowerPoints, but we're going to ask them to also do a poster so that we can put them up and keep all these great ideas. And you can see them. I mean, PowerPoints are almost like performance art, you know. They, it's hard to see them unless you sit down and slog through it. So you want to have something you can just look at as well. So we're hoping to be able to do more of those. So it sounds like they're more community-based instead of like invention-based. Like they don't want to make an invention to solve a problem. They want to set up an organization or a business. There have been inventions. Um, there was one team actually, they, got, they did get some funding. They were looking at some small-scale uh, solar thermal uh, equipment. And they're still plugging away. <laughs> um, so it, it really has been a whole range. These are great questions. And anybody else? I mean, I, I can talk forever, but you don't want to hear me talk forever. Well, and again, I probably asked too many questions as it is. But 
you know, as you've come out here to the po Polytechnic, uh, in many of us, in fact, we've done several posters on our Native American projects. And I would hope at some point, maybe we should reciprocate by coming in and spending some time and maybe let Marcus and some of the tribal members come in and, and make those presentations. So at least Perfect. we know what's going on. We, we'd love then, to do that. And then as we look forward, like the Colorado Ute Tribe, as you know, has done major developments in terms of algae and aquaculture and milk. Mm -hmm. the, the worldwide leadership you've had in that area, you should find a way to sort of adapt that. And by the way, I did send in my stuff to Richard today, so hopefully. But, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of potential there. Well, one of the things I was talking about with Dr. Chu, um, who left, uh, is that part of what we do at the American Indian Policy Institute is we help coordinate projects with researchers that may be um, interested in working with tribal communities. And you know we only have so much capacity, but if we can help and it's appropriate and tribes are interested, we, we can sometimes be willing to do that. But we're always interested in students. We have students who come and talk with us and we try to be supportive and um, all across all the campuses here. Would you like to say anything, Althea? I was wondering about the Bay Cal program. Um, is it ongoing or is, are there results being used? It actually could be ongoing. <laughs> um, Gila River might take some more samples. It's not super active right now, but the risk reduction part of it is still ongoing, and the person you'd want to talk to is Leroy Williams in the AIR program. He was sort of the lead, although Russell also worked on Russell Bitsui. And um, we're actually talking about getting all the JTAP team together again to look at some new issues. It, w it worked so well. Everybody enjoyed it so much, and everybody got to know each other. We, you know, we joke. You probably all heard about the water buffaloes in Arizona. It's these group of old folks that deal with water, and some are scientists and some are lawyers. Well, we now joke that there's the airheads. And it's the, all the people who worked on JTAP from all the different regulatory agencies. You know, the technical people love to work together. Um, will that be in, in any presentation at the um, Tribal Forum Air Quality Conference? Is that what you're taking part in? It's been done in the past. Probably there will be other issues at the recent ones. But yeah, JTAP was a major presentation at the Tribal Air Forum in the past. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, good luck. I hope that. Good, good. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. I always love coming out to Polytech. So thanks a lot. Whatever. <laughs> Excellent presentation, Dr. Ariella.